Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church in Modesto. I am Pastor Deborah Brady. It is good to gather as our hybrid community, some of us in person in our beautiful sanctuary at 16th and I, and others of us are online on our webpage, on our Facebook page, or on our YouTube channel. We invite all of you to use mobile devices to greet each other in cyberspace as God weaves us together for the purposes of worship this day. Today is a special day in our congregation. We call it Consecration Sunday. And during our offertory, we're gonna be presenting envelopes that have in them our commitments and promises for our ministry next year, both for how we are serving and what our financial plans are. And so for those of you who are uh, guests and first time visitors, please don't worry about this. It's not for you. It's meant for the people that are here all the time. So you can just sit and observe what we do. And I will uh, give instructions later uh, for that, but you can see the baskets up here in these reeds and we'll give instructions as we get closer to the offertory. So guests and visitors, everything that you need to assist you in worship will be on the screens. And so we want you to feel comfortable uh, and participate as you feel led to do so. And uh, we hope that you'll fill out your registration card or for those of you who are online, uh, you can send us an email and let us know how to come alongside you. Friends, what a week it has been. So many things um, burdening our hearts in our country and across the globe. So in addition to our own personal issues, we bring all of that here uh, before God as we worship. Let us center ourselves, uh, tuning in to all the ways that we experience God's message for us. Take a breath and remind yourself the Holy Spirit is here. Sometimes we get messages through our physical sensations, so tune in with your body. How does it feel? Are you alert and present? Open your heart, ready to receive God's love, ready to offer it to another. Let your mind be quiet so that indeed you might feel the guidance of the Holy Spirit there. Let us be relaxed and energetic at the same time, alert for the messages God has for us this day. worship series called People with a Purpose. People committed to God's purpose understand that we won't always see the fruit of our labor. Moses led the people of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, preparing them for the promised land, yet he himself would never enter it. As we contemplate another season of ministry for our congregation, we consider the ways we might anticipate future concerns and needs and invest ourselves in a way that provides for future disciples of Jesus to carry on our mission and ministry. I invite you now to rise in spirit or body as we invite the Holy Spirit's presence and guidance.
please join me in a spirit of prayer. Oh God, in mystery and silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives and to attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit that we may know the joy you give your people. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing Hymn of Promise. The lyrics will be on the screen or you may use the red hymnal number 707. May the Christ, the peace of Christ be with you. Please greet one another with words of love and peace. Join me in a responsive reading of Psalm 90. We will be reading from the Common English Bible Translation. You'll note that periodically we will pause and join in a song response. We will practice it as first as we listen to our musicians sing it to us and then join with them. been our help generation after generation. Before the mountains were born, before you birthed the earth and inhabited the world, from forever in the past to forever in the future, you are God. 
You return people to dust saying, go back, humans. Because in your perspective, a thousand years are like yesterday past, like a short period during the night watch. You sweep humans away like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. True, in the morning it thrives, renewed, but come evening it withers, all dried up. back to us, Lord. Please, quick, have compassion for your servants. Fill us full every morning with your faithful love so we can rejoice and celebrate our whole life long. Make us happy for the same amount of time that you afflicted us for the same number of years that we saw only trouble. Let your acts be seen by your servants. Let your glory be seen by their children. Let the kindness of the Lord our God be over us. Make the work of our hands last. Make the word of our hands last. Our first scripture reading is Deuteronomy chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. This passage is the conclusion of the fifth book of the Bible and the final passage of what the Jewish community calls the Torah. Listen again for God's word to us. Then Moses hiked up from the Moabite plains to Mount Nebo, the peak of Pisgah Slope which faces Jericho. The Lord showed him the whole land, the Galilee region as far as Dan's territory, all the parts belonging to Nephtali, along with the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, as well as the entire of Judah, as far as the Mediterranean Sea. Also the arid southern plain, and the plain including the Jericho Valley, Palm City, and as far as Zorar. Then the Lord said to Moses, This is the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which I promised. I will give it to your descendants. I've shown it to you with your own eyes. However, you will not cross over into it. Then Moses, the Lord's servant, died. Right there in the land of Moab, according to the Lord's command. The Lord buried him in a valley in a Moabite country across from Beth Peor. Even now, no one knows where Moses' grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyesight wasn't impaired, and his vigor hadn't diminished a bit. Back down in the Moabite plains, the Israelites mourned Moses' death for 30 days. At that point, the time for weeping and for mourning Moses was over. Joshua, Nun's son, was filled with wisdom because Moses had placed his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to Joshua, and they did exactly what the Lord commanded Moses. No prophet like Moses has ever emerged um, in Israel. Moses knew the Lord face to face. That's not even to mention all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent Moses to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his servants, and to his entire land, as well as all the extraordinary power that Moses displayed before Israel's own eyes. This ends our scripture reading through which the Spirit continues to teach the church. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, choir. You join me in a spirit of prayer. Oh God, as we come to ponder these ancient words of scripture, we receive your blessing of deep peace. May it sink deeply into our hearts and minds, deep into the marrow of our bones, that we might be receptive for the work you do in the midst of this shalom. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. For the last several weeks, we have accompanied Moses and the Israelites on their 40-year journey in the wilderness out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land. The promised land was part of the covenant made with Abraham several centuries before. Our reading today from Deuteronomy 34 ends the first five books of the Bible, known as the Pentateuch or the Torah. These critical books of the law ends by narrating Moses' death on Mount Debo. And so what a fitting blessing our choir's anthem is today as we give thanks and remember Moses' life, ministry, his death. Now, Moses had known for some time that he would not be allowed to enter the promised land. So I want you to imagine with me Moses' last climb up a mountain to commune with God. While the congregation of thousands wait below, he goes off alone to hike a 2,300-foot uh, climb to this ridge above the Jordan River Valley. So in this view, if you look carefully at the top, you can see the Christian church on top of the ridge commemorating the events of our scripture reading. Now this climb is not at all like climbing Mount Whitney, but nevertheless, I bet it got Moses' heart rate up. I mean, he was 120 years old after all. Speaking of heart rate, I wonder what Moses' heart was like that day. He won't ever speak to his congregation again. Was he full of grief? Was he relieved? Was he heavy-hearted in this final ascent? When Moses's, Moses reaches the peak, God invites Moses to gaze at his life's work, the culmination of the risks, the adventures, joys, bitterness, fear, struggle, bumbles, and stumbles that were all a part of the persevering faithfulness of these past 40 years. They look together across the valley toward the Mediterranean Sea as God describes the various boundaries of the tribal lands. I imagine it was a bittersweet moment as Moses stood there and imagined the descendants who will inhabit this land and continue to live more fully into their covenant with God. And then Moses dies, alone on Mount Nebo, with God as his sole witness. We are told that it is God who buries Moses in a place known only to God. Our sermon title today, The Long Now, was inspired by our lay leader, Wildeboard, during our stewardship and worship planning session last August. As we considered this ending to Moses' ministry, Will told us about a foundation that he had been following for some time called The Long Now. I had never heard of this foundation before, so I checked out their website, and I'm here to tell you, I got lost for a couple of hours during, down various rabbit holes of the amazing and inspiring thinking that this group of people are doing. And as a result, I am, yes, now subscribed to two more email lists. P. 
people who are engaged in the Long Now movement think about how our actions now can affect the far distant future. They keep a 10,000 year clock. And they describe all kinds of creative things that human beings are doing to prepare the citizens of the universe to engage in vibrant ways. I mean, very smart and creative peop people have done amazing things. One of them created this little small decoder device, a little sphere that has picture instructions about how to use it and pictures and descriptions of the Earth's biosphere and the topography and its history and how to survive there. And they have placed this in deep orbit for future space explorers to discover. The long now thinkers imagine environmental and economic policies that might sustain future human communities on Earth centuries from now. For example, the feature essay on their website right now uh, is by Forrest Brown, who offers us this pithy economic analysis. When we are bound in a system of reciprocity, not return on investment, we will be closer to being the kind of ancestors future people need. In his book, The Good Ancestors, How to Think Long-Term in a Short-Term World, author Roman Krasnarek describes six ways to think long-term. First, we develop deep time humility. We understand that no matter how pressing, how urgent issues are for us right now, we are just an eye blink in cosmic time. It's not really all about us. Second, we cultivate a legacy mindset. We act now and invest now in ways that our descendants will thank us. Third, we concern ourselves with intergenerational justice. As we make decisions, we consider the impact of our decisions on the seventh generation that follows us. Fourth, we engage in cathedral thinking. We plan projects in a way that bears fruit beyond our own lifetime that will provide what the future generation needs. Now, we had a recent example of cathedral thinking. I think we all remember April 2021, as we watched a raging fire consuming uh, much of the beautiful Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. I mean, if you're like me, we just couldn't stop watching it as the roof collapsed. And surely one of the world's most beautiful buildings was destroyed. But soon after the building stopped smoking, social media and news reports were abuzz that there was a grove of rare oak trees growing near Versailles. The grove was planted a century ago just for this very circumstance so that repair and replacement could be a relatively easy process, at least as far as the building materials go. So in reality, there wasn't quite enough wood to replace everything that burned. France still had to collect lumber from other parts of their country, but still the sentiment remains. It's the long now cathedral thinking that serves the present generation in preserving this treasure. Now, I'm thinking perhaps those people in Versailles were inspired by the practices of others. There's a story of Oxford's new college, which isn't really new. It was founded in 1379. Uh, one of its most impressive buildings is its oaken dining hall. And about a century ago, uh, it was discovered that the roof was infested with beetles and needed replacing. So it was suggested to them that they kind of search for oak trees on the land that had been endowed to the Oxford colleges. And it turns out they're run by an Oxford College forester. 
So this man was called to Oxford where he was asked if, the, if he had any oak trees for them to use. And he said, well, sir, we was wondering when you would be asking. It turns out that the college foresters continually plant groves of oaks to replace the wooden roofs of Oxford College. This plan has been passed down from one forester to the next for over 500 years. Cathedral thinking. So let's return to the final two ways that we cultivate our capacity to think long-term, according to Roman Krasnerik. The fifth is to engage in holistic forecasting. We don't overinvest in one solution, but we envision multiple pathways for future civilizations to thrive. And finally, we commit to transcendent goals that are beyond our own scope and concern. We strive to imagine not only how our own communities, our own country might thrive, but how the whole planet might thrive. As I think about Moses and the way he led the community of Israel through the arduous wilderness journey of transformation from a ragtag group of slaves to people with a purpose uh, prepared to live in covenant blessing, I can see how Moses was committed to the long now. So why wasn't Moses allowed to enter the promised land? We learn of the reason back in the book called Numbers, Numbers chapter 20, when the community is experiencing another water shortage crisis. It is a very similar story to Exodus 13. Uh, Exodus chapter 17. And in fact, the community, the congregation, they're back in the same place as Exodus 17. Apparently, they traveled for years clockwise in this great big circle. They come back to the same place and they have a same crisis. And the people complain bitterly to Moses and Aaron about their dehydration and the threat to their lives. The community is on the brink of an insurrection. So Moses and Aaron, they pray to God for, for, for intervention. And God responds with instructions. God tells Moses to take his staff, the same one that he sent years before had held over the Red Sea during their escape from Egypt, and to gather all of the community before the rock and to command water to come forth from the rock. So Moses, takes his staff and he and Aaron gather the entire congregation in front of the rock. And then Moses gives the congregation a tongue lashing. Listen, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And then Moses lifts up his staff uh, and his hand and he strikes the rock twice with that staff. Water came out abundantly and the congregation and their livestock drank and they were saved. So the endeavor is a success. Yet God proceeds to tell Moses and Aaron that because they did not trust God, because they did not show God's holiness to the congregation and took all the credit themselves, they were not gonna be allowed to enter the promised land. This story troubled me when I was a child in Sunday school. I remember asking my teacher why Moses was being punished like this. It did not seem fair to me. My teacher said, well, because the first time this happened, the witnesses were just a smaller group of the leaders of Israel, and God told Moses to strike the rock, and that's what he did. But this time, with all of the, everybody, the entire congregation uh, gathered, Moses was told to speak to the rock, to command the rock to yield water, but instead he picked up his staff and hit it twice. So since he didn't obey God, Moses was being punished. Now, I was very troubled by this answer because it seemed like God was being such a stickler. I mean, if striking the rock was the right action the first time, what is the big deal? I mean, maybe Moses was stressed out that day and he just didn't notice the nuanced instruction. And he just thought, oh yeah, 
I remember what we did years before. Like, I remember what I'm supposed to do. We've, we've been here before. It terrified me that I might accidentally get a little detail wrong and then have to pay dire consequences. Now, my teacher was on the right track, if not a little overzealous with the opportunity to teach little children about the importance of obedience. While the people were in some ways back in the same spot, they were not the same people. They were different people after all these years. This is the purpose of the wilderness journey. God was asking Moses to be a different kind of leader. But instead, Moses relied on his old strategies. God could see, undoubtedly Moses realized, that the next generation would require a new kind of leadership in the promised land. Now, if Moses were immature and not committed to following God, I think he would have just quit right on the spot. He could have just like snapped his staff in two and thrown it on the ground and said, fine, if I don't get to enter the promised land, you lead these people yourself. From now on, you're on your own. I am out of here. But demonstrating humility, Moses did not abandon his calling, but recommitted himself to the long now. He kept the legacy of future generations in mind. After consulting with God, Moses selected Joshua to be his successor and spent years teaching him, mentoring him for this leadership role. Moses focused on the transcendent goal that through this congregation of people, God intended to bless all the nations of the earth. I wonder, as Moses stood on top of Mount Nebo on the last day of his life, if he imagined us sitting here thousands of years later, reflecting on his life and ministry. Perhaps Moses got a view from God, a vision from God, a glimpse from God of a 10,000 year clock. I mean, even if he couldn't imagine smartphones and Zoom and self-driving cars and spaceships to Mars, not to mention the endless wars that continue in the beloved Holy Land. Yet here we are, recipients of the promise later fulfilled in Jesus. Gentiles like us grafted into the covenant. Like the foresters who tend the oak groves in England, the gospel has been learned and lived, planted and nurtured and passed down generation to generation to us. Today, we have a short video from one of our younger family of disciples who are a part of our community. Let's meet Emily Bryant and her children, Sienna and Brantley. Hi, my name is Emily Bryant, and we've been coming to church here for, gosh, two years now. And so Sunday school started for us this year. I started as a Sunday school teacher. And I feel that it's brought so much purpose to our life, just changed how we view um, the church, and we've got to meet so many people. Did you want to say something about Sunday school? But um, she's really, at first she was a little nervous to join in on Sunday school, but since I started, she really has just blossomed, and her faith has blossomed. So I feel that it's brought purpose for us as far as meeting people. Like when we first started, we really didn't know a lot of people. So when we got involved in Sunday school, we've met Madeline and we've met so many just new people that I didn't know before on a personal level. And the commitment and the just being committed to the church has really changed us. So, And Brantley here, he goes to Tiny Tots. And so he is really 
thriving at Tiny Tots. He loves it. Um, he goes uh, Monday through Thursday full time and the teachers are amazing. He gets chapel on Wednesdays, so that's fun for him. And he gets to be with Pastor Deborah. And also, Sienna gets to come in and see them too on certain days. And so, yeah, we really love it. How do you, do you love Tiny Tots in your preschool? Yes. <laughs> so, and how are you with Sunday school? Are you enjoying Sunday school? Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. A little more than before. <laughs> that's great. So yeah, she is not shy at all with anybody here, which I love, and it's it's been amazing. So it's brought so much purpose for us. All right. Thank you, Emily and Sienna and Brantley. We are grateful to, for, that you are a part of our congregation. You know, as human beings, we are very prone to focus on the present. And especially on a day like today, I am very grateful for the saints who have gone before us including those who began this congregation 161 years ago at the Bernieville Ferry on the Stanislaw River. I'm grateful for those who began our endowment fund, for all those who year after year continue to leave their own legacy there. The earnings on their investment now uh, contribute over 10% to our operating budget for ministry. Today, we are, being given, we are being given the opportunity to be people of the long now as we consecrate our ministry plans for next year. One thing that helps us is to keep people like the Bryant family in our minds and hearts as we make decisions, such as how will we use our space? How will we adapt our spiritual formation and discipleship processes and practices to accommodate the needs and schedules of young families? How we prioritize our spending and our investments. In 10 years, Brantley will be a teenager. He'll be 13. Sienna will be a young adult. How is what we are doing now going to support them in those stages of life? What will they need? In 50 years, will they find the forests that we have planted so that they will have the resources they need when beetles attack or fire destroys the infrastructure of their lives? Will they see that their ancestors were people of the long now? Living as people of the long now requires that we practice being people with a purpose, setting aside our own personal preferences in order to collaborate on a higher purpose. Being people of the long now requires sacrifice and risk-taking and many uncomfortable things. It means standing on a ridge and gazing at a future that will not be ours. May we trust the Holy Spirit to stir our imaginations so that we live our present lives in a way that future generations will be blessed in ways that will cause them to give thanks for the legacy that we have left them. Amen. As we prepare for our time of prayer, let us sing together as the deer, which you may find in the black hymnal number 2025. We will sing it twice. The lyrics will also be on the screen.
As we come to our time of prayer, I remind you that we encourage intercessory prayer as a daily practice, and so we offer you the joys and concerns of our community every Friday in our Friday announcements that come by email. They're inserted in the worship materials that you can find online or in person, inserted in your order of worship. And we invite you to take that as a resource and lift things up, and you can email us if you want to add something to the prayer list. You can write it on the back of your registration card if you're in person. One thing uh, that I want to add is that our sister uh, Evelyn Adams fell uh, and f has some fractures in her pelvis. Uh, she is in 99 years old, so uh, her bones are fragile and we keep her in prayer. She's in Emmanuel Hospital. We pray for her daughter Janet who's caring for her. We also uh, remember uh, Helen and Ed Wilhide and thank them for our altar flowers today. And, we are tender-hearted with them, as these flowers are in memory of their son, Joey, whose birthday is this week on the 2nd. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? God of the mountain top, in prayer you walk us to the highest point from which we are offered an opportunity to view the world as you see it and the world as you wish it to be. There is much to be thankful for, for we enjoy opportunities of good health and reasonable living standards, of times of relaxation and times to work, of a roof over our heads and opportunities to feed our bellies and our imaginations and the aching of our hearts. From your vantage point, we praise you for all that is good for us and allow you to draw our eyes from our concerns to those of our neighbors, our community, our world. In prayer, our eyes are drawn to see those in need of love in our community, both here in our church and in the parish of which we are a part. Help us not to be afraid of what is different or unknown to us, but instead willing to offer friendship and accept the opportunities to grow in knowledge and experience. Our eyes are drawn to places of power and leadership as we look for those who govern to offer leadership in difficult times. May those who seek to serve as politicians and leaders of communities find themselves shaped by the words, hopes, and ideals of those who place their trust in them. Our eyes are drawn to places of hunger and need. Teach us to share the resources we would covet. Enable us through the activity of your Holy Spirit in prayer and with action to be a part of a creation where all are treated fairly, all have enough to eat. As you, Lord of vision, draw our eye back to the world of which we are a part, may our lives be shaped by you to offer others a vision of your love shown in our faith in Jesus the Christ. We continue to pray together in the way that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, as part of our next steps in discipleship, we have the privilege of celebrating the ministry of two of our mission partners. So we have Jennifer Ward here, who is the convener for our community engagement ministries. And we have Nancy Porteous Thomas, who joined Jennifer this year as co-leaders of our Falling Leaf Boutique and Pantry. So 
We have the leaders from our beneficiary agencies with us. And so Jennifer and Nancy, I hand it over to you. Tell us what happened. Thank you. Yes, um, we are here today to celebrate and to share the fruits of our labor, which we heard from the scripture. Sometimes we don't get to, but today we do, which is really exciting. So I would like to introduce Elizabeth White from the Food Initiative of the Greater Stanislaus today as one of our beneficiaries from the Falling Leaf Boutique and Pantry. Um, they at FIGS, with Elizabeth's leadership, they are doing the work that our church community here strives to do. They are reaching people who are most in need, feeding them, clothing them, and finding housing for them. So we appreciate the covenant relationship that we have with FIGS. Nancy? I'd like to introduce Gina Machado. She is the Deputy uh, Executive Director of Center for Human Services. This is an amazing organization, a nonprofit in our county um, that serves individuals, children, families, uh, adults all throughout Stanislaw County. Uh, they provide uh, an array of incredibly important uh, services, including mental health services, counseling, um, support groups, the child navigation uh, programs, uh, emergency housing, counseling support for young people from 13 to 25 years of age. Um, they provide K through 12 education, intervention, and treatment for young um, students throughout the county. Uh, they provide uh, workforce development services uh, for people in need in this community, and they provide substance abuse um, services for the entire county. You do tremendous work, and uh, it is just such a pleasure to welcome you here and to be able to share some of the proceeds from our uh, Falling Leaf event. Uh, I would also like to take this moment just to thank everyone in our congregation who helped um, serve before, during, and after the event to make it a very big success. Uh, we're hoping next year will even be a larger success, but if uh, you worked in any capacity, um, in this event, I would like these uh, recipients to see who you are. So if you just stand or raise your hand, uh, we can acknowledge you too. Okay, so it's. present this $4,000 giant check so we to need you in the Elizabeth <laughs> White and uh, the Food Initiative of Greater Stanislaus. Congratulations. And yet another, Gina, we would like to present this check to your organization so that you may continue the wonderful work you're doing for this community. Uh, we are just delighted to be able to partner with you uh, and thank you. Hopefully this will help. Uh, and uh, we look forward to serving you and the community in the future through our joint work. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you, Elizabeth and Gina, for your work, for being with us today. We're excited to be your partners. As I said earlier, today is Consecration Sunday. Visitors, just this is an opportunity for you to just meditate and observe how we do things here. Um, it's for those who've made a commitment to the mission and ministry of our congregation. So during the offertory, we often invite you to look through our announcements and our inserts to plan how you might engage in ministry in the weeks ahead. But today, you can still do all of that. There's lots of things coming up here in the next few weeks. But during the offertory, uh, we're gonna invite you to bring your card in your envelope, your cards. And I forgot to mention earlier, we had blank ones. We have them out on the information table. If you forgot those and you wanna fill them out or you can do it after the worship service. And just come down the center aisle and you see these beautiful wreaths here. There's a basket on top of each one of them. Just put your envelope there. And uh, these envelopes go to our financial and ministry leaders to help them begin to make plans for our ministry next year. And uh, if you have offerings and registration cards in your hand, you can bring them here. We have baskets out there, but if you wanna just join the great procession like a liturgical dance today, just bring those. We'll take anything, put, put anything in there, that's fine. Um, if it's difficult for you to walk or uncomfortable to come all this way, just hand it your envelope to a neighbor or an usher and somebody will carry it for you. So. We're grateful for your faithfulness, for your vision, for being people of the long now. Let us uh, listen to the offertory as it accompanies us in this ritual of consecration.
Please join me in our responsive prayer of consecration. Loving God, we present to you our faith promises and plans for ministry for the coming year. They represent our intentions to be faithful disciples of Jesus. We make these promises because you first loved us, truly see us, and we are grateful. We make these faith promises because we know you are God and money is not. We make these promises because we trust you to give us our daily bread. We declare our intentions to be people with a purpose as we serve our community in the ways of Jesus. Help us to be generous to those we call to serve us, to provide a place for people to learn the way of Jesus, and to generously extend your grace through transformational acts of mercy. May we be surprised by all that is done through these efforts. And may your will be done. We, we pray, pray in Jesus' Jesus name. name. Amen. Amen. We invite you to remain standing for our closing hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's in the red hymnal number 110. The lyrics will be on the screen.
Hello, I'm Leslie Williams. I'm chairperson of the Staff Parish Relations Committee. And today we hope you will join us in Fellowship Hall for a reception as we celebrate Pastor Appreciation Month. We have delicious cakes from the Village Baking um, Company down there, so please join us. And now I'd like to offer our bit of addiction today. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make her face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 